All right, everybody. Okay, how are we all doing on this wonderful, lovely day? I have to say I'm surprised as many people as you guys actually got in your cars and came here because you all know how dangerous it is to drive around here when the weather is nice here in Sacramento. Um, you know, when the, when the rain and the snow comes out, it's almost like you're dealing with uh, kind of a, I don't know, NASCAR with lobotomy or something. I don't know how else to describe it. So I'm great you're all able to make it out here. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, my name is William McDade. I'm the astronomy coordinator at Sex City College, and I am often asked to be the MC here at Darwin Day. So I want to start by introducing Minga Futrell, who at the moment is sitting down right now. We have a pretty full docket. Yeah, she, she apparently she wants to stay sitting down. Well, that can't stand. No pun intended. And all the speaker here is, is early, which is fantastic. Uh, we do have one change in the schedule. The science guy will not be performing, unfortunately. So if you're a science guy groupie, um, sorry. So we will get started on this while all the details of the speaker are sorted out. And of course, after we're done with the introductions, the mockingbirds will perform if they are still here. Oh, good. You're, okay. I, I wasn't sure if you went home there for a minute, but okay, great. We always have technical problems at the beginning, don't we? And at the last minute, the podium has to be moved. Then again, then again, then again. And the next thing you know, it's three o'clock. Let's not do that this year. All right, Mingo, if you'd be kind enough to come up, we can start the introduction and get the ball rolling on this. Only nine minutes late. First. Trust me, that's a victory. to see such a nice group of bipedal primates out here today. <laughs> I don't know, either you're real science enthusiasts or you're crazy, one or the other. But I, I prefer to think the uh, first. Appreciate you coming out on this rainy day. It is kind of uh, bad, or at least it was when I was leaving home. Uh, this is Sacramento's 17th annual Darwin Birthday Gala. Yay! <laughs> We weren't the first to start uh, this kind of event, but we were in pretty close to the first. And I'm extending this welcome to you on behalf of all the organizing uh, committee. We're volunteers. You'll see our names listed on the inside of your program, right there. And um, who are we? Well, we're just simply science enthusiasts. We want to toast science for its contribution, for its benefit to humanity. And there are local celebrations taking place in other parts of the nation and also the world. There's, they have lectures and sermons and museum exhibitions and films and uh, um, parties um, annually commemorating Darwin Day. And these local events are to remind the community of the benefits of science. And each event is marking some way uh, the birth of Charles Darwin, uh, which, uh, gosh, we're way up there on numbers now for him, his birth, and his accomplishments, and uh, his uh, superb contribution to human understanding. And how different, really, our world is now because of what he did back then. I don't know if you know, if you're my age, you may know, uh, but today is the anniversary of another event. How many people know the other event that this is the anniversary of? February 9th, 1964. Oh, not many. That shows my age. Uh, uh, it was a TV program broadcast 50 years ago. It lasted an hour. And it was what some call today a seminal event in American television history. Check your watches and your phones as you're heading home, because by the end of today's program, uh, given uh, the difference in time zones, uh, it will be just about the exact time that the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan TV show in a debut. Watched by, get this, 73 million people, a real milestone at that time, and one that's held up over time. 
The Beatles' new and different sound and appearance 50 years ago was something like a bombshell. It was a convergence of factors that made for one of the most defining and memorable moments in the history of music and television and pop culture. And it not only changed the music scene, but new hairstyles, new clothing, fashions, the younger people screaming at celebrities, you know. If you weren't around to view it at that time, and I presume most of you weren't, uh, you're so young, um, what a cultural shakeup it really kind of was. But the songs that those four people brought across uh, the Atlantic back then are on our iPads, they're in our cell phones and being carried around uh, today. They're in the stores and elevators all across the nation. And their hairstyles that were shocking back then are not shocking at all. In fact, they look rather tame to me. So what we're celebrating today is the 205th anniversary, birth anniversary of somebody who made quite a splash in his day as well. Although not necessarily a popular splash at the time, or even now with some people, Darwin's shakeup took place in science, and it too was a singular event. It was a revolutionary publication of the origin, his The Origin of Species. And his daring idea has gone on to produce far more penetrating effects on our lives today and in the many, many, many fields of science and all across the world. Contemporary scientists deem his theory of evolution through natural selection the most powerful scientific theory ever developed. So I say to all of you who are champions of evolution and science, let's celebrate Darwin who was and remains a scientific giant. And let's celebrate his contribution to the progress in so many areas of science that has taken off since he and Alfred Wallace put forth the proposition about the mechanism of evolutionary change. At this event, we welcome science enthusiasts of every stripe and particularly educators because we also promote and defend sound science education in curricula and public school programs, and in media, such as through the New Cosmos program with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And do we ever need better scientific understanding by the public? Seriously, folks, with climate change quickly gaining in speed and anti-environmental regulation lawmakers denying the science behind it, a citizenry with a grasp of science is the strongest defense against an unsettling future that we face. I'm going to name some names here, and they're mentioned in your program, but I'm going to ask you to wait to applaud uh, the whole lot of them at once. Besides the organizing committee, which I've already mentioned, uh, there's my co-chair, Rhonda Silva, Ruth Rizos, Bill Potts, Ken Nahibian, uh, I've also had assistance in putting on the event from other science uh, enthusiasts who have volunteered for key roles, such as refreshments, Diana Ruth and her team. And of course, let's not fit, uh, forget some of the co-sponsors at the outreach tables along the, the side there. Uh, you can see the, uh, you can see the uh, part of your program for those, and please do visit the tables over there and talk with the people who are staffing them. We're grateful to all of them. Uh, we have a few college-level science departments that endorse our event, and you will see that there are several nonprofit organizations as well. Some have a rep, a rep that's attending. I don't know if I will catch them all. Uh, but if the rep would stand up uh, I, and wave, um, now like I said, don't clap until the end, just eyeball so you'll know who's over there. And then you can visit the table uh, later on and possibly you'll be able to hear at that point in time. I had a hard time talking at the table. Uh, did the National Center for Science Ed make it this time? Glenn said he might, but uh, he doesn't look here. Uh, Camp Quest West, uh, David is over there waving at you. Uh, there's the Humanist Association of the Greater Sacramento Area, and we've got Tom and Wendy. Uh, the atheists and other free thinkers are here. That the one with the hat back there, that's uh, Ken. The purple. <laughs> the purple. Is, what is that, Ken? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, the Bright's uh, net, Lori is over there. Um, uh, and Americans United for Separation of Church and State, uh, Jack is here. And the Sierra College Natural History Museum, right there. And I don't think the zoo had, uh, made it. But uh, please have a look at those tables and visit the sponsors. And uh, everybody who's helped with this event in any way whatsoever, would you please stand up and let everybody else give you applause. Come on. We organized this event, call it a gala. We want it to be gay, not just uh, uh, the main program, educational, but also to have a social event. And so, uh, besides turning your brains on to science a little bit with our formal presentation, uh, please have some fun with the music and the merchandise that's available over here and the refreshments and the cartoons along the wall. We're going to uh, celebrate Darwin's big idea by eating up his birthday cake today and also have a bit of camaraderie afterwards. So uh, it's important to recognize, and we do, uh, the great diversity of people um, who uh, do appreciate uh, in evolutionary theory and how important it has been to human understanding of the natural world. And Darwin has become a symbol. We hope to see this holiday grow. Uh, and um, it, it can promote a common bond, actually, between all of the people uh, when we start to see the world in a natural way and not be divided over ideology uh, and especially between the religious and secular points of view. And in the current uh, social and political context, I think we all have to work harder to preserve sound science as a hope for humanity. We need allies, so next year, please bring your friends, your uh, neighbors, and uh, come, and in the meantime, Enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Great. Outstanding time here. I also want to uh, have someone come up to make an announcement. David? From Camp Quest West, who asked to do this earlier, before we get to the Mockingbird music, which is next. Let's see if I can tighten that up. So, it's David from Camp Quest West. Thank you so much. Um, I want to let everyone know that we are having a little raffle drawing today. Uh, back at our table over there, we're giving away one of David Fitzgerald's most recent books about Mormons. And any donation of any amount will go to our camper program, camperships, uh, for kids to apply to for financial aid so they can do our camp in July. Um, I'm going to switch hats and also just say that if you attended Free Thought Day back in October and you didn't get the shirt or the bag that you uh, were uh, supposed to get when you donated, uh, we have all the extras back there as well. So. Come on by, see what we got over there. Thanks for coming today. Thank you, David. And without any further ado, because there's been too much to a doing anyway, the Mockingbirds.
Sure, so we can't hear ourselves, so we hope that's coming out okay. Um, we are the Mockingbirds. We are so excited for Darwin Day because we love to sing songs about science because it rocks. And the other singer can't be, or he's here with the laryngitis or something, so they've asked us to throw in a couple of extra songs, and we thought, okay, sure. So, <laughs> we'll see what we can come up with. We don't really have a lot of music for it, but we're gonna see if you like it. This next one is about Darwin that I wrote the words to. You may recognize the, the tune if you were brought up in a church. And so, here we go.
Mr. Wallace and Mr. Matthews. You heard me talk about them a little bit before. Some people don't realize that, oh yeah, there were other people who came up with the idea of natural selection at the same time or around the same time as Darwin did. They held, they held a contest who could write the best song for Darwin Day. This one won number one. No, I didn't write it. I know you're thinking, but of course you didn't. No, I didn't. Okay, so it was written by David Hines, and it was the first place winner. We thought we'd share it with you today. Mr. Darwin on the Beagle sailed the oceans and seas to South America and to Haiti and New Zealand Maldives to Australia and Tasmania, Keeling Island and St. Helena to Ascension and Mauritius and Brazil the Venice and Galapagos Islands Mr. Darwin on the Beagle sailed away for five years he sailed away, away Since arriving at NASA Ames in 1987, her research has focused on how life, particularly microbes, has evolved in the context of the physical environment, both here and potentially elsewhere, and how we might tap into nature's toolbox to advance the field of synthetic biology. 
Field sites range from Australia to Africa to the Andes, from the ocean to 100,000 feet on a balloon. In the last few years, Rothschild, Dr. Rothschild has brought her expertise in extremophiles and evolutionary biology to the field of synthetic biology, addressing how synthetic biology can enhance NASA's missions. Since 2011, she has been the faculty advisor of the Brown Stanford award-winning iGEM team, which has pioneered the use of synthetic biology to accomplish NASA's mission, particularly fo focusing on the human settlement of Mars and astrobiology. Her lab is working on expanding the use of synthetic biology for NASA with projects as diverse as recreating the first proteins de novo to biomining to using synthetic biology to precipitate calcite and produce glues in order to make bricks on Mars or the Moon. Dr. Rothschild is a fellow of the Linnaean Society of London, the California Academy of Sciences, and the Explorers Club. And please, please welcome Amit Dr. Rothschild. I very much appreciate everyone coming today. You're not going to hear nearly anything about all that fine stuff, because today's for Darwin. Um, but I can't start without mentioning the Mockingbirds. That was amazing, and I'm willing to give my piece of cake up to each and every one of you if I can record any of those songs. That was absolutely fabulous. Thank you very much. And it, and it saves me any effort to sing here. Um, I thought before I started this that I would just Google Darwin in the news, and that was kind of fun because the last couple of days, it turns out, uh, Representative Rush Holt of New Jersey, so there is good news coming out of New Jersey, recently reintroduced a resolution in the House to designate February 12th Darwin Day. The idea would be there would be a day for people to have extra deep and hard thoughts. So we can just imagine how that's going to fare in Congress. Nonetheless, we appreciate his efforts. So, um, without further ado, what I'd like to do is um, talk a little bit about astrobiology, where my heart and effort has been um, most of the time that I've been at NASA, and tie that into Darwin, because um, really we couldn't be doing what we're doing in astrobiology if it hadn't been for Darwin. Um, I spend a lot of time in the United Kingdom, and um, some of my colleagues there say, oh, well, we don't have much of an astrobiology effort in um, the UK, and I say, yeah, but if it weren't for Newton and Darwin and Kelvin and a few of those other Brits, we wouldn't even have the field, we wouldn't be able to get anywhere. So um, it's very appropriate that we're focusing on Darwin as the key to what we're doing now um, and very relevant to this very day. So what I'd like to do is start with the scientific revolutions. Um, BC, what I call before Copernicus, there were the heavens and the earth. This is your sermon for the afternoon. There are the heavens, and there's the earth. The problem is they were seen as separate, that the physical world um, was separate from the, the world of the heavens. But the great thing is Copernicus made the earth part of the physical world. It was something that you could study as a scientist, if you consider astronomers scientists. Um, I need to stop making these aside. Um, anyway, I, I can only say that because I work with astronomers. Um, so then there was Descartes and his followers, and they realized that there were stars um, out there that were suns, just like our own sun, that our own sun wasn't special, just like the Earth wasn't special. It was one of probably billions and billions and billions of suns. So we were at this point that the physical world became an object of study, but what about the natural world? That still wasn't part of it, and that's what Darwin did. That's what the Darwinian revolution was all about, making the biological world something that was a subject for science. So today we celebrate Darwin and his man and his work, um, Search for Life in the Universe. But the thing is that before we can really understand Darwin's contribution, we have to understand a little bit about the time that he was born into and what he actually did. And I should say that one of the reasons that we feel so warm and fuzzy about Darwin isn't just what he did, but that he was very much of a person. You feel like you could sit there and have dinner with him in a conversation. And so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a feel for Darwin as a person as well. So when Darwin was born February 12th, 1809, same day as Lincoln, um, people were still not sure about the age of the Earth. 
spontaneous generation was out. At least they knew that, that rats did not um, come from dirty piles of linen in the corner. We passed that stage. Um, extinction was just starting to be on the radar screen, and in fact, um, Jefferson really helped put the last blow, and yes, Thomas Jefferson, by sending Lewis and Clark out there and not being able to find any mammoths. I mean, surely, with this entire um, trip of theirs, they would have found a mammoth if they existed, and they didn't. So people were starting to come to grips with the fact that not all organisms that had been created by God or whatever um, were still here with us. Um, catastrophism was on its way out, uniformitarianism, the idea that you can understand the physical processes in the past based on what we see today. So that was the sort of world that Darwin was born into in 1809. Um, I actually know him quite well. Here's a picture I took recently when um, he absolutely was shocked that last minute of the San Francisco game, as we all were, and you can see that look on his eyes. I can't believe this. Um, and in fact, you know, if you don't believe me that I knew Darwin, take it from some of these tortoises in the Galapagos, I knew Darwin, nice guy. I mean, you know, what better, what better source do you have? And from all um, all indications, he was a nice guy. You know, someone, again, that you could feel like, um, hey, you know, it could have been me or it could have been my neighbor or whatever. So, as I said, Darwin was born February 12, 1809, and if you're near the front, you can see there's a, a very cute picture of him when he was about six or seven years old. And interestingly enough, it's, I think, the oldest known picture of him, and he's clutching a plant. So maybe that was prescient. He was born in, um, in his... Um, father's house up and you see in the top panel and when he was fairly young was sent to this grammar school that you see in the bottom mr chase's apparently he was shy and reserved he invented all sorts of wild stories he was mischievous and he enjoyed being the center of attention sounds like sort of the average six-year-old um sadly uh when he was eight years old his mother died and so this was very difficult he was one of the younger children of a very large family his father was larger than life. He was a, a well-known doctor. Um, his grandfather had also been a well-known doctor. And when I say his father was larger than life, apparently by the time he died, he was close to 300 pounds and very tall as well. So he was this enormous presence and ended up raising the children you know, with the help of the older sisters and so on by himself. He never remarried. But this was a very difficult thing um, for Charles, even though all he says about it in his um, autobiography is he sort of vaguely remembers, you know, after she died. Um, so he became very close to his next older brother, Erasmus. Um, they started doing chemistry experiments um, in the, in the um, greenhouse and so on. Um, maybe the ex-greenhouse, I don't know. It depends what sort of chemistry experiment it was. Um, but at some point, he, his older brother was sent to medical school. He went to Cambridge, but then spent um, a year or so at the University of Edinburgh. Um, there's a castle in Edinburgh. Um, in, in the spirit of full disclosure, both of my children are enrolled at the University of Edinburgh. I figure if it was good enough for Darwin to go, it was good enough you know, for my kids. Um, anyway, he actually was, Darwin was then sent there, not as a student immediately, but to keep his brother company. This is where his father had gone to medical school and his grandfather because Edinburgh at the time and still to a large extent is thought of as the free thinking university. The, the, you go to Cambridge and Oxford if you're more sort of the status quo and you're aiming to be prime minister or you know follow along but the, the radicals were up in Edinburgh um, probably the long cold winters or something. Anyway Darwin was sent up there to keep his brother company and um, to start to attend uh, classes there. And um, there's a picture of Edinburgh today up in the top, and down below is a picture of the medical school where um, he was starting to attend classes. There's a plaque there. Um, I actually gave a lecture there about um, a year and a half ago in a, in a renovated theater. I was sort of hoping it would be one of the, the really old ones, but it was a nice renovated room. But you can still see the outer part of the building. Anyway, it turns out to have been a disaster um, to a large extent because at the time there was no anesthesia. So um, as Darwin said, he attended on two occasions, this is right from his autobiography, um, the operating theater in the hospital at Edinburgh and saw two very bad operations, one on a child, but I rushed away before they were completed, nor did I ever attend again for hardly any inducement would have been so strong enough to make me do so. This being long before the blessed days of chloroform. 
The two cases fairly haunted me for many a long year. And the story from his children was he absolutely, he had a large number of children himself that he couldn't deal with it when they even scraped their knee. They had to go to their mother, someone else. He just couldn't deal with people being harmed. Um, and so, you know, having to tell this enormous, imposing, um, very, you know, definitive, some, you know, great member of the community sort of father that there was no way I'm going back it must have been an extremely difficult thing. And so his father took a deep breath and basically said, well, there's one other option. You can become a clergyman. And it was sort of like that. So he studied up for the summer and he got into Cambridge where he went for divinity school. Um, his father was rather displeased about this. He thought he would amount to nothing but a, quote, idle gentleman, unquote. Um, and so he entered um, Cambridge, was in Christ College, and there's a contemporaneous picture of the outside of Christ. Um, and down below is a picture, I think, of a reconstruction of what his dorm rooms look like. So for those of us who went to college a good deal more recently, you know, it's, it's very luxurious quarters for a dorm room. And in fact, he spent much of his undergraduate time hunting and carousing and so on. Um, but that's sort of the party line. In fact, at the end, he did study very hard and did place fairly well. Um, this is a picture of what the inside of Christ looks like now. And you can see yet again, Darwin was here sort of bust on the side. Um, and again, this is a contemporary picture we took last year at Cambridge. And there's the zoology apartment, where I actually um, did some work quite a while ago. Um, on the left side, across from that, is the geology area, and that's where Darwin, um, although he didn't study, he spent a lot of time. Because at the time, you couldn't study science. In fact, the word science wasn't even invented until 18, um, I believe it was 20 or so, um, by Huell. Um, science from Scante to know. But this was not a subject you could study. There was no such field. However, you could attend lectures. And so, in fact, when he was in Edinburgh, he started to go to a society and did a little research and learned taxidermy and a few other things, spent some time with Grant. And when he came down to Cambridge, he ended up spending a lot of time with the Reverend um, Henslow, and as well as Adam Sedgwick, who was a geology professor. Henslow was a botanist. And there's another, I think, probably a role model for Darwin of someone who could be, um, could be a minister as well as being a naturalist. And they spent so much time together, Darwin's nickname was the man who walks with Henslow. So that was all in good, and he said, passed his exams and uh, graduated and was sitting around sort of <laughs> gearing up to become a country um, Carson, which he was not, you know, really relishing when, of course, everyone knows he got this letter um, offering him a place on the Beagle. And um, actually, he'd been on a geology tour in North Wales before that and had planned another big expedition. Um, unfortunately, the friend that he was going to do the expedition with died suddenly. And so this really was all of a sudden, you know, his, his life as a, as a naturalist seemed to be coming to a screeching halt when this letter came. The problem is, in those days, you certainly didn't do anything at, without your father's consent, particularly since he had all the money. Um, and his father, of course, strongly objected to this whole idea. Um, I mean, it, it, there was one problem after the next, and he, you know, Darwin was so upset because this was, you know, this was his chance to put off being a clergyman and do something that was much more aligned with his interests. And his father, you know, was a, was a good man. He was imposing as a good man. He finally said, look, if you can find any man of common sense who advises you to go, I will give my consent. And so Darwin did what, in retrospect, was probably to be expected. He got on his horse and went over to visit his uncle, who had always taken a, a real liking to him. Um, so his father put down all these objections that it would be disreputable to his character as a clergyman. It was a wild scheme. They must have offered it to many other people who turned it down. And so since they had turned it down, there must be something seriously wrong with either the expedition or the vessel. He'd never settle down to a steady life thereafter. Um, the accommodations would be uncomfortable. This would be considered changing my profession yet again. And it should be a useless undertaking. And, you know, bless his uncle's heart, he was able to um, write uh, answers to each of the objections. And in fact, at the end, Darwin, seeing that he was, he was winning his case, said to his father, you know, I, I know I've been rather extravagant at Cambridge, and so to console his father, he said, I should have to be deuced clever to spend more than my allowance while on board a ship. 
To which his father apparently smiled and said, but they all tell me you are very clever. And so again, you know, it, it, for the parents in this room with college-age students, doesn't this resonate? It could be today. Uh, anyway, off he went on the Beagle. They thought it was going to be a two-year trip. It turned out to be um, uh, quite a bit longer. And there you can see they went down from um, England down to South America, up and down the... Um, up and down the eastern coast of South America charting, and then um, Darwin was seasick every minute of the way, so he got out of the boat as soon as he could and ended up going through the continent on horseback, picked up again in the um, western part, of course, went to the Galapagos, and so on, um, and all the things that you heard about in the song. Um, and this is where learning to be a taxidermist all of a sudden came in handy, all the time learning botany with Henslow and geology with Sedgwick um, and studying with Grant. All these things came together. And that's what I like to tell my students who are doing you know, these wonderful random things, that the trick is to put that together in your life to something that is uniquely you. And that is exactly what Darwin did. Um, and here are a few beautiful pictures of the Galapagos if you're up front. Um, sadly, I did not take them because I have never been, um, but colleagues have, and I gather it's beautiful. And again, just to remind you that he really, at this point, was a kid who just gotten out of college. He wrote in one of his letters from Buenos Aires, our chief amusement was riding about and admiring the Spanish ladies. After watching one of these angels gliding down the street, involuntarily we groaned out, how foolish English women are. They can neither walk nor dress. How ugly miss sounds after Senorita. <laughs> so then when he got back to London, oh dear, you know, he was actually already famous at that point. He had been clever in a way that Wallace hadn't, in that um, he had sent samples back continuously that were well preserved. Wallace unfortunately waited till towards the end and the ship that many of his samples were on sunk. So Darwin had things sent back. They, were, they got themselves to the top people who were already examining. So by the time he got back, he was already a minor celebrity in London. And on top of it, his brother, who by then had graduated from medical school, had decided that medicine wasn't for him either and had became a, a, actually a famous host. And so he sort of knew everybody in London and really took it upon himself to introduce these people and open doors for his brother and also trade a little bit on his brother's fame. And at that point in his life, he started to put one and one and one together and come up with this idea of natural selection, which we'll go over in a moment. Um, what I'd love for those of you can see on the bottom right, this is Darwin's um, first doodle about an, an evolutionary tree. This is from his transmutation species book. And um, What's interesting is it doesn't actually look like a tree much. For someone who works on protists, which can include algae, I always thought it looked kind of like a seaweed. And in fact, other people thought that, and that's why he wrote a tree, and did more of a tree version afterwards, because apparently people told him, you know, you're gonna have enough trouble with this, but to have your whole thing boil down to a picture of a seaweed is probably not gonna cut it. I'm obviously taking a little artistic license here, but basically that, now. I love the idea that it would look like a seaweed, though. And as I'm sure many of you know, at this point, um, he was single, and um, as, as, again, someone in their 20s, late 20s, starting to think, you know, maybe, maybe I should consider getting married. And when he went off in the Beagle, he did have a girlfriend. She broke up with him while he was aboard ship and got married, which apparently he was absolutely crushed about. When he came back, he sort of came to the realization he'd always really liked his cousin Emma. And um, in the end, he, he thought good and hard about it. And for those of you who don't know, Darwin being Darwin, he wrote a, a whole list of pros and cons of getting married. Now, I'll just give you an excerpt here. The advantages of not marrying and remaining a bachelor. Freedom to go where one liked, choice of society and little of it, conversations of clever men at clubs, not forced to visit relatives and to bend in every trifle, to have the expense and anxiety of children, again, those of us paying college tuition understand this, perhaps quarreling, loss of time, cannot read in the evenings, fatness and idleness, anxiety and responsibility, less money for books, etc. If many children forced to gain one's bread, but then that's very bad for one's health to work too much. And perhaps my wife won't like London, then the sentence is banishment and degradation with indolent idle fool. Okay, so that, you know, 
that, that, that pretty much convinced me. But, you know, being a good scientist, he did the flip side. He said, okay, so what are the advantages of getting married? And again, I, I paraphrase. Freedom to go where one liked, choice of society and little of it, conversations with clever men at clubs, not forced to visit relatives and um, children, if please God, constant companion who will feel interested in one, a friend in old age, object to be beloved and played with, better than a dog anyhow, <laughs> home, and someone to take care of house, classics of music and female chit chat, these things good for one's health, forced to visit and receive relations, which you then end up crossing out, but terrible loss of time. My God, it is unthinkable to think of spending one's whole life like a neuter bee, working, 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 and nothing after all. No, no, won't do. Imagine living all one's days solitarily in smoky, dirty London house. Only picture to yourself a nice, soft wife on a sofa with a good fire and books and music, perhaps. Compare this vision with the dingy reality of Greater St. Marlborough Street. Mary, 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 Q-E-D. So, off he did, uh, off he went, um, he married his cousin Emma on 29th of January, 1839, and fairly shortly thereafter moved to Down House, where he spent the rest of his life. Um, it's now open to the public, there are a few modern photographs of it, it looks very much like it did in, in Darwin's day, and it's just, you know, fascinating, you sort of feel like you're in his presence. Um, of course, he started having children, and on top of that, he continued to work. Now, what he didn't do is put out this idea that he became fixated on for the transmutation of species. Um, what he did do is try to gather evidence. And one of the areas where he tried to gather evidence was specifically on barnacles. And for people who are biologists, it's a good idea to have some taxonomic group that you're particularly knowledgeable of because it gives you sort of a point of reference. And so he spent literally 10 years working on barnacles. And in fact, some of those books that he wrote are still considered classics. And in fact, apparently it was so much of an obsession that when one of his kids was visiting a friend's house and asked where his father was, they said, oh, my father's you know, in London at work. And I said, well, wait, if he's a in London all day, when does he have time to do his barnacles? I mean, his kids just grew up thinking every father did barnacles all day. So he worked on the barnacles and various other things. Um, and then there was a terrible blow in his life. And that was that his second child, his oldest daughter, um, died at age 10. And of course, we're not supposed to have favorites, but in every indication, Darwin felt extremely close to Annie. Um, and was absolutely distraught about this. And in many ways, um, we believe that that's what helped break his last real relationship to having a, an omnipotent, um, all-controlling God, because he felt, you know, why would, why would a merciful God um, take Annie at such a young age? She hasn't done anything. So that was bad enough. But then a few years later, of course, he was at breakfast one morning and received out of the blue a letter and a short manuscript from a young naturalist named Alfred Wall Russell Wallace. Now, Darwin at this point was nearly 50. He had quite a reputation. So it was not surprising that Wallace would send this letter to him, you know, hoping this great man might think that there was something to this idea. He, it wasn't meant in spite or whatever. It was meant, you know, please could you help mentor me sort of thing. But Darwin looked at it and went into shock. He said, it, it, if I'd asked um, you know, someone else to write a two-page abstract of my work, they couldn't have done a better job. And so, in spite of what you may hear in the press, Darwin, again being Darwin, was willing to drop the whole thing and, and publish this because this kid had really put it pencil to paper first. And his friends who knew that he had really spent the last um, 25 years of his life focusing on this problem of transmutation of species arranged to have a joint presentation to the Linnaean Society, um, his friends being the, the famous geologist Lyell, the botanist Hooker, and, and Bennett, um, who was a lawyer. And um, they presented this. Here is a, a contemporaneous um, oil painting of the Linnaean Society looking very elegant. And out of Darwin's autobiography, he said, our joint productions excited very little attention. The only published notice of them, which I can remember, was by Professor Houghton of Dublin, whose verdict was that all that was new in them was false, and what was true was old. 
This shows how necessary it is that any new view should be explained at considerable length in order to arouse public attention. So, yes, it was presented in public, so they had the priority, they had it out there, but it was not the big deal that we like to think it is. And in this, again, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm a, a fellow of the Linnaean Society as well, and here is that same room today, and you can see it looks very much like it did. We don't wear fancy dresses anymore, and now there are oil paintings of Darwin and Wallace on the wall. Okay, so he was spurred into action and obviously wrote up what he called an abstract of his work, his abstract being what, you know, five or six hundred pages. You know, it's, it, one shudders to think what the full work would have been. And out it came 22nd of November, 1859, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, um, or The Preservation of Favorite Races and the Struggle for Existence. It sold out the very first day it was published. Now, I've since found out that the, the publisher was a little nervous about this, so he sent the book out for peer review, which is the bane of scientists' existence. You know, imagine sending your work to your harshest critics. Well, it was sent out for peer review, and apparently all three peer reviewers panned it. But the publisher thought, well, you know, I think there's something there. I'm going to override this and publish it anyway. So this is a great example that if you're discouraged by bad peer reviews, you know, journey on and someday maybe you'll get, find a John Murray who believes in you. Um, and even that, you know, this was an enormous event. Later that month, Lord Palmerston proposed to Queen Victoria that Charles Darwin should be conferred knighthood. But um, Bishop Wilberforce, who becomes the heavy at this stage, you know, absolutely intervened and said, not, you know, over my dead body sort of thing. Um, and here, you know, here's the beginning of it. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but just to read you a sentence or two, again, it's worth reading these books. It, it speaks to us today. When on board HMS Beagle as a naturalist, I was much struck with certain facts in the distribution of organic beings inhabiting South America in the geological relations of the present to the past inhabitants of that continent. These facts, as will be seen in the later chapters of this volume, seem to throw some light on the origin of species, that mystery of mysteries that has been called by one of our great philosophers. So very, very accessible. He said, look, this is it. So for those of you who haven't actually read it, it's a very clever structure, and this is why we remember Darwin today. There were a lot of other people who had ideas of transmutation of species, including his grandfather, Erasmus. But Darwin had a mechanism, and he had the data to back it up. So if you look at the, the various chapters of the origin of species, the whole key is those first four chapters. Okay, so let me just run through the argument. The first is that there's variation under domestication. Hey, you know, I went to talk to a pigeon breeder, and you know what? Not all pigeons are the same. And if you take the big bird, big pigeons, and you breed them together, you end up with big babies. I talked to the orchid breeders, and if you breed the ones with the purple flowers together, you get offspring with purple flowers. And I talked to the horse breeders, and I talked to the falcon breeders, and I, I mean, it was on and on and on, absolutely overwhelming. So there's this variation under domestication. But you know what? There's variation in nature, too. Look around the room, and you'll see that everyone looks different. Um, I taught astrobiology at Stanford for 10 years, and sure enough, two years in a row, I had twins in the class, so that line didn't work. But nonetheless, normally, if you look around the room, no one else looks quite like you. There's variation in nature. But the problem is that the, we, we increase exponentially, but the food supply increases geometrically, uh, sorry, arithmetically, and so there's a problem. We have more offspring that are born than can possibly survive. This is the struggle for existence. So the question is, and this is now chapter four, who's going to be the one who survives? And so it's very much like this analogy with artificial selection. If you breed the orchids with the purple flowers, you get purple flowered offspring. The same thing happens in nature. If you've got the wolves with bigger fangs, their offspring have bigger fangs. It's a very, very powerful argument. Um, I don't know if it was mentioned, but I um, did my master's at Indiana University in southern Indiana and was teaching evolution and ended up um, having quite a bit of exposure to various creationists. And I've yet to meet anyone who doesn't agree with that basic argument. 
that there's variation in nature, you end up looking more like your parents than anyone else, and so you can get change by this. Really, the issue is how much you can extrapolate this. And so what creationists tend to tell me is it only works within kinds. Well, there is no such scientific word as kind, so usually kind is sort of the limit of their imagination. Darwin's imagination took it through all of the natural world. Um, so again, an incredibly powerful argument. And then, interestingly enough, the whole rest of the book is trying to poke holes in his own argument. So he goes into the laws of variation, knew nothing about genetics, turns out he had a copy of Mendel's book and never even cut the pages. Um, instinct hybridism, the imperfection of the geological record, geographic distribution, embryology, blah, 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 you can go through all that on your own. Um, so, again, very, very powerful argument, and it was an instant sensation. In 10 years, basically every scientist, certain, every member sort of of the, the literati was, was absolutely sold on this. Um, but, you know, it, it did take 10 years. That's not much time considering what they were fighting, but it took 10 years. And it, about a year or two later, there was a very famous Oxford debate um, at the, the society. And there's the hall that the debate was um, held in. And apparently, although Darwin wasn't there, Huxley, who became Darwin's bulldog, defended him, was there. And Bishop Wilberforce, who ended up with the nickname Soapy Sam, and there was quite a bit of um, jousting, verbal jousting back and forth that had to do with um, um, details of each other's mothers. And apparently it got to be such a big deal that women fainted and you know, had to be carried out. And you know, boy, I wish I could go to that exciting scientific meeting. Anyway, uh, it was something else. But it, again, it, it, when I talk to students or, or people who are not completely sold on evolution, I said, don't try the arguments today. Don't, you know, don't even look at the so-called scientific, you know, creations or intelligent design. These are just sort of post facto things made up. Take a look at the arguments that Darwin used that managed to convince every scientist, basically, not everyone, but virtually every scientist at that time in public opinion, because these are the ones that were the most powerful. Um, of course, quickly afterwards, the or, um, transmutation started to gain acceptance throughout Europe, and then in 1863, this first Archaeopteryx was discovered, um, which provided a, a missing link. Owen dubbed it um, Archaeopteryx and so on, and so this, this was, you know, again, evidence that what Darwin was saying made a lot of sense, that there were a lot of imperfections in the fossil record, and there was a lot still to be discovered. So Darwin's real contribution, I like to say, is providing a mechanism for evolution. Not just that there was change, but a mechanism. Now that doesn't mean every last thing in evolution has occurred because of natural selection. I am sure you could come up with any wacko idea of oh, even an asteroid hitting the Earth, and it's happened. But what you're talking about is what the main, you know, main mechanism is for most of what you see. So once we have this mechanism for life on Earth, how can we take this elsewhere? It has a huge amount of explanatory power. So I would argue that since the dawn of humans, we've not just looked at the diversity of life around us, but we've also wondered, as we looked up into the stars, whether there was anything else up there. And this is what this astrobiology revolution is all about now, um, taking this idea of evolution and asking not just where in the past, or all, all the mechanisms where we come from, but also where we're going and are we alone. This is a perfect time because we're starting to discover many extrasolar planets, which I'll mention a little later, life in extreme environments, which is a lot of what I've been doing. Um, molecular evolution has advanced enormously. I remember being in grad school and you'd sit there on a believe it or not, a Friday night discussing whether such and such little speck was related to another one and you'd have your micrographs and so on. And sort of the conclusion at about 10 o'clock at night was, I think it's this, but we will never know. Now we can have a much more certain feeling about relationships that we couldn't before because of being able to read DNA. 
And then, of course, we've had an enormous number of space missions that have actually gone out there. So it's not just a matter of sitting here and saying, gee, I wonder if there's something on Mars. We've got a flotilla of spacecraft orbiting and on the surface doing our work for us as, as um, our geologists. So all this contributes to what I like to think of as the astrobiology revolution, which is that last one after Copernicus and Darwin, now this astrobiology one, which takes the Darwinian revolution and now explodes it so that you can apply it to the entire universe. So what we're doing um, now is focusing on three very, very broad, but incredibly appealing questions. Where do we come from? Not just evolution, but bringing in the physical environment, going all the way back to getting a habitable planet, having the building blocks for life, having a habitable solar system and a galaxy, all the way back to the Big Bang. So it's taking Darwin and, to my mind, making it far, far richer than he imagined it. And then looking at the flip side, with what we know about the physical world and how it's changing and the biological world, what's going to happen in the future as we go forward? Just because we're here doesn't mean that the sun has stopped burning and the moon hasn't stopped going away from the earth and all these, other, you know, that we will eventually collide with the Andromeda galaxy. Don't get, you know, don't stay up at night worrying about it. We probably are not going to actually hit something that, you know, there's a lot of space in there. But there are a lot of things that are going to happen, and just because we're here doesn't mean that the world is stopped. And then, of course, this question of are we alone? So I like to sum this up by calling it the Battlestar Galapagos. <laughs> the problem that we have in astrobiology, if we're going to start looking forward, is we only have one field site. When Darwin was arguing natural selection, he could say, well, you know, I went to the pigeon breeders and the orchid breeders and the horse breeders and the dog breeders and the cat breeders and the, you know, but we don't have like the Martian breeders to go to and the Europan and the, you know, this galaxy and that. We have one data point and that's our wonderful field site here. But the great news is that we've got lots of life here. Um, and it goes through all sorts of environmental extremes, temperature and pH extremes and radiation and salinity and desiccation because we use water and chemical extremes and pressure changes and some organisms even live in high electrical impulses. So what we do is we take these organisms that live at the extremes to get some feeling for what the minimum envelope is for life. It just simply says that if we find some place out there that, say, is a boiling mud pot, we know that there's an organism on Earth that can live in a boiling mud pot, so it's worth looking there. It doesn't mean it's the same organism. It just means there's nothing about that environment that precludes life. So again, this gives us a minimum envelope for what life might be like in the universe. So here we go. Are there other boats for life? I love this slide. This is Iowa. Iowa is the moon of Jupiter. Um, I've yet to have the nerve to show this in Iowa, but there you have it. So um, here we are in Sacramento, and um, NASA, sort of as a shorthand, uses the mantra, follow the water. The idea is that all life on Earth uses water as a solvent, and there are a lot of great reasons for it. It doesn't mean that there might not be another kind of solvent you could use, potentially liquid ethane or methane or something. It's less likely, but you know, water is a really great solvent. It's, it's worth using, and so it's not a bad sort of first cut as a way to start to look. So if we're going to do that, let's just look at our own solar system. Um, obviously, the first planet from the sun is Mercury. It's um, very hot on one side, pretty cold on the other, um, not quite tidally locked, but it's just not the kind of place that you would expect life. Very dry, not, no indication whatsoever that it's habitable or ever has been. So let's just quickly leave Mercury in the dust and move on to Venus. Now Venus is a really, really interesting planet. Today it is absolutely hellish. The atmosphere is about 90, to 90 atmosphere pressure, so it's 90 times more pressure than on the Earth today. The temperature on the surface is about 450 degrees Celsius. To remind you, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So this is hot. There is no you know, if, ands, or buts. It is really hot. In fact, the surface of Venus is the hottest planetary surface in our solar system. The pH is zero, so this is really acidic. 
You remember that pH is a log scale. Our stomachs are at about pH 2. So this is about 100 times more acidic on the surface than our stomach fluid. And the winds are about 300 miles per hour. So if anyone offers you beachfront property in Venus, this is not the place to invest. But four and a half billion years ago, when the solar system was formed, the sun was about 25% less luminous. And Venus is about the same size as the Earth. It should have gotten the same, um, same raw ingredients. And so we think it was much more Earth-like, possibly until as recently as about half a billion years ago. So what happened was Venus had a runaway greenhouse. You've heard about the greenhouse effect. Well, here's an example of what happens when you end up with a, a runaway greenhouse. The water started to evaporate. Water is a great greenhouse gas. And so as it evaporated, it made the atmosphere even more opaque to the radiation going off, and so the surface got hotter. So there was this feedback loop, and it got hotter and hotter and hotter as the oceans evaporated, and you ended up with this hellish place that you have today. But the interesting thing is, that didn't happen until after life was well established on the Earth. And since Venus should have been basically our twin, could life have arisen on Venus at that time and then gone extinct, which we probably would never know because the surface has been reworked since it's so hot? Or is it possible that life arose and as this runaway greenhouse occurred, life simply migrated up into the clouds? And this is something that Carl Sagan suggested in, in 1967. So if you go 50 to 60 kilometers up in the atmosphere, it's one atmosphere pressure like on the Earth, about 0 to 100 degrees Celsius, so basically freezing to boiling. Again, just a nice range for life. Plenty of sun, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all those things that you need. The only real problem with this idea is that if you go outside, our clouds aren't really green or pink or, or orange. We know there are organisms living in there, but we don't know if they're actually metabolizing and um, having a whole life cycle or if they've just been transported up there. And so that's one of the projects that my lab's working on. So that's the story of Venus. We're not even going to stop at Earth because we know that that's well infested with life. Just look around you. So let's move quickly on to Mars, which of course has caught the public's imagination for, for many, many years because it's close by. Again, similar to the Earth, but instead of a Venus situation, it's smaller than the Earth, a little bit further out, but mainly it's smaller. So its tectonic activity would have run down and it would have lost its atmosphere and become very cold. Where Venus had a runaway greenhouse, Mars ended up getting very cold. Nonetheless, there are seasons, there's polar ice caps, and these are things that were observed from the Earth. And so NASA started sending spacecraft up there in the 60s. So here's the, an image from Mariner 4. And for people in the audience of a certain age, this doesn't look unlike television images in the, you know, in the 40s and 50s. It's sort of dotty. Um, you don't really see much from these pixels, except you don't see any Martians waving. And only a few years later, Mariner 9, you get a really clear image. And you, oops, I don't know why it went up so quickly. And you certainly don't see any um, Martians waving now. What you do see are what looks like dried riverbeds. And in fact, this is interpreted by geologists to mean that they were dried riverbeds. Very, very simple, called geomorphology. So again, what we think is that Mars started off like the Earth, and unlike Venus with the runaway greenhouse, its atmosphere um, was pretty much lost. It still has an atmosphere, but it's much less than on the Earth. And this is just to put all the planets in perspective. There's our little blue marble down there, and there's Mars um, just in front of it, slightly over to the right. Um, and then you see Venus slightly larger there, and then little Mercury. So this is what we imagine it might have happened. On the, on the right side here, what you see is, is a Cliff Notes version I put together of the history of life on Earth. The formation of Earth about four and a half billion years ago, and you start to see good evidence for life by about 3.8 billion years ago, but there's some suggestions that it could have even arisen much earlier, like um, even as early as 4.2, 4.3 billion years ago. Um, on the other side is an idea of what we have of, of what happened on Mars physically, and you can see that this period of time where we think there was enough atmosphere to keep Mars wet, if not warm, at least warmer than, um, than it is today, 
completely overlaps with the origin of life by quite a, mat quite a bit of time. So again, it's like Venus. If life arose here, the building blocks were the same on all three planets. They were pretty much the same during this time. Shouldn't life have arisen there as well if it is a physical, chemical, maybe even necessity, certainly a high probability. Of course, the, the other possibility is that life started on Mars, since it would have been in better shape a little bit earlier, it would have cooled faster since it's smaller, and then been transported to the Earth, in which case all of us are Martians. Now, I'm saying this absolutely with straight face, because we, we know that Mars would have been a better place for life to begin a little bit earlier than the Earth. We have plenty of examples of meteorites that have made it to the Earth. Um, so we know that that transport, everything's in place. It's not highly likely, but there's nothing about that that would give you a, a total giggle factor, except that the transit time is a bit long. It's something that, that's within the amount of time that spores today on Earth could survive, but it, it would take a whole series of things happening just right for it to happen. So that's the situation with Mars. Jury's still out. It could have had life early on. Um, it could even conceivably have life in the subsurface today where there is possibly some liquid water um, or in some of the polar ice caps where there could be some liquid water. Again, they're not big oceans there, but as I tell my geologist friends, I'm a microbiologist. I just want a tiny drop. That's all we need. I don't need a global ocean. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, we can get you a tiny drop. So, um, jury's still out. Not, you know, well, I'm not going to say not likely. The jury's still out. But actually more exciting, and I wish it were closer, is um, Jupiter's moon Europa. Well, actually, Jupiter has a couple of these Galilean moons, but um, Europa in particular is very bright. This was noticed very early on. And the fact that it is so bright and reflective indicated to people early on that it was covered with ice. So here's an actual photograph of the surface of Europa taken by the Galileo spacecraft, it's up there, and you can see it's, it's white, it looks like dirty ice. Well this discoloration we think are organic compounds, not organic compounds like you know you go to the grocery store and there's the organic food section, but <laughs> organic compounds to a scientist means something based on carbon and hydrogen. Um, so diamonds, if you got one, don't count. Pencil, graphite, doesn't count, but virtually everything else does. You know, methane, sugars, DNA, fat, you know, everything you eat for breakfast, all that stuff counts as organic carbon. So you've got the ice, so at least frozen water, and the organic carbon, but even better, even though it's farther away than Mars, it turns out that the magnetometer on Galileo suggested there was water sloshing around underneath this salty brine. People say, whoa, well, that's impossible. It's so far away from the sun. But it turns out that there is a frictional interaction between Jupiter and Europa, just like there's a frictional interaction between the Earth and our moon. And this interaction is strong enough, generates enough energy to keep the water liquid beneath the surface. And that's where the beauty of using ice, uh, water as a solvent comes in. Because water ice is unusual in that it floats. Most compounds, when they freeze, sink. But water in a frozen state floats. And so that allows you to have a gin and tonic, and it allows you to have an ice-covered moon like Europa. So great stuff there. So that's something that you know, the astrobiologists have been really interested in for, for a couple of decades now. This is not actually a photograph beneath the ice of Europa. I wish dearly it were a photograph. This is my wildest dreams. This is an artist's rendition of a little um, hydrobot going beneath the surface and finding these hydrothermal vents with lots of organisms um, all over the places. It looks kind of like sponges and so on. I mean, this would be fabulous. And I'm not the only one who's dreaming about this. It's a matter of where NASA puts its priorities because it's a, a relatively expensive mission. Um, but wouldn't that be cool to be able to have a, a little um, hydrobot going beneath the surface sometime in our lifetime? And even better if it found something. So now let's move on to the next planet, which is even further out. Turns out that it's got a couple of moons of interest. The first one is Titan. Now, we also have a spacecraft out there, the Cassini mission. 
Um, but as part of the Cassini mission, a probe, the Huygens probe, was dropped down onto the surface of Titan um, on the 14th of January 2005, so about um, nine years ago. And it was only supposed to go for, send back data for about two and a half hours as it went through. Um, it was spectacularly successful. In fact, uh, I went to a seminar in the geology department at Stanford that afternoon where the professor literally was standing at the computer watching the data come down and sort of giving a running commentary. I, I, I hope that there's no one in this room who is so jaded not to understand how cool it is to get living data basically from the surface of Titan. I mean, this is, this is very, very cool stuff. Um, so Titan was of enormous interest because unlike other places in our solar system, actually even Earth, we knew there was an enormous amount of organic carbon. This whole atmosphere is this haze of organic carbon. It's almost like someone went into a, a chemistry lab and just broke a bunch of test tubes. It's all over the place. But then they got through this atmosphere, the, the um, Huygens probe, and sent back some photos. This is an actual photo that Huygens took on its way down to the surface. And what is so fantastic about it is it looks so familiar to me. You can see what looks like a lake, and interestingly enough, it's been interpreted as a lake. And you see what looks like riverbeds, which have been interpreted as riverbeds cutting into mountains. The difference between Titan and the Earth is it's way too cold for liquid water. So this ocean here and the rivers are probably liquid ethane and methane. These are very short little hydrocarbons. And some of the rocks there are frozen water. Um, I should just say, to me, that, that picture looks even more familiar than that um, because I, I spend an awful lot of time changing planes at O'Hare. And to me, it looks exactly <laughs> like landing at O'Hare. So I did finally take a picture of landing at O'Hare once and pixelated and so on and played nasty tricks on colleagues before, but I wouldn't do that to a nice, <laughs> nice group. Like so um, that's not all the tricks that Saturn's got. Saturn's got a lot of moons, and it turns out there's another one which has gotten on our radar screen and is pushing its way up to, you know, prime suspect number one, and that's this little moon called Enceladus. Not enchilada, Enceladus. Um, when I say little, this gives you an idea. Here's a picture of it superimposed on, on the UK. So you can see it's not very big, but what you can tell right away is it's very bright, and again you think, ah, I bet it's a big ice-covered moon. And in fact, you would be right, here the, the discoloration is bluish, the scientists call these tiger stripes, and again we think it's organic carbon. But the cool thing about Enceladus is we don't actually have to wait for another mission to understand what's beneath the ice, because it's got a geyser, it's got sort of this leak built in, um, which the scientists call cold faithful, very cute. And here you can see a thermal map at the bottom. Now, that pink part in there is not hot, it's just a lot hotter than the um, green and the, the orange and the blue and so on. So you can see there's a relatively warm area in the southern hemisphere, and even better, we have a, some idea of what's in that water that's shooting out. And you can see besides water and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and hydrogen, you start to get into things like um, formaldehyde and ethanol, and that may not sound exciting to you, and ammonia and nitrogen and hydrogen cyanide, and then even longer chain carbons. And it's very exciting to an astrobiologist because these are all the building blocks that put together right can start to make amino acids and so on spontaneously. That's the kind of thing that that Uri and Miller proved you know, um, decades ago. And in fact, you're already part way through the Uri Miller experiment. So it's an extremely exciting place because we don't even have to drill down. We can just fly through the plume. The unfortunate thing is it's a distance out there. Now it turns out there was a little um, something in the news just a couple of weeks ago, Ceres. Ceres, it turns out, is um, one of the largest members of the asteroid belt. So it's back in closer to us. It's between Mars and Jupiter. And even though it's the biggest asteroid, it's still not very big, but we think it may be a similar situation to Europa and Enceladus, an ice-covered body, potentially with liquid water, and again, much closer. So I think now people must be starting to imagine a mission to Ceres. Um, you probably heard that NASA's 
been thinking about an asteroid capture mission, and I think right now I'm probably not the only one who, you know, is raising my hand and saying, you know, go fetch Ceres, guys. This would be so cool to have. Um, believe it or not, there are even people who think that Pluto might have an ocean beneath an icy shell, and the good news there is we will know um, this year, actually, the New Horizon mission's on its way out, and it'll get some rough idea. Um, beyond Neptune, there are all these trans-Neptunian objects, and some of them you can see are very bright and white, so you've got to think ice. Um, not sure why you would get a melted interior, but you know the, the solar system alone is full of surprises. So what happens if you go beyond our solar system? Well, once again, NASA is on it. Um, you probably heard of the Kepler space mission. We're extremely proud of it because it is one that was um, thought of and um, designed and run by NASA Ames, which is unusual. Um, where I work, we always have the great ideas. That's not the unusual part. It's just usually places like JPL end up then running the missions and we're not heard from again. So we're all the crazy mad scientists, but this one we actually ran and it's been phenomenally successful. And again, it's like Darwin having the peer review rejection. Bill Baruki, whose brainchild this was, um, had rejections for 10 years, but he kept at it and eventually it was accepted. So what Kepler did, is, and I unfortunately have to say did because it, it seems to have lost its oomph, um, is stare at 150,000 stars. This is incredibly simple. It just stared. The only time it stopped staring was when it turned around and sent data back to the Earth. So why was it staring at 150,000 stars? What it was looking for is tiny bits of diminution of the light, so the starlight to go down just a little bit in intensity, just about 1% even. And to have this happen in some periodic fashion, so maybe once every few months or a year or whatever. So as you can see, it's a very tiny part of the Milky Way galaxy, but still, 150,000 stars is nothing to sniff at, and the answer is we now know, well, at least we have thousands of candidate extrasolar planets. We also have some that have been verified by ground-based telescopes. Jeff Marcy at Berkeley has been one of the leaders in this whole field. This amazing video um, was I downloaded from the Kepler website two years ago, amazingly. Um, they stopped making them because you couldn't get it all into one image. What this is, not all the planets, the extrasolar planets that Kepler had found at the time, but the ones that were part of solar systems. So these are all planetary solar systems, and you can download this yourself and sit there and watch it on Friday night. It's a lot of fun. Um, turns out that we're not necessarily typical. Indeed, there are planets that have two stars like Tatooine, and um, there are planets that do all sorts of funky things. We are not necessarily the only game in town. So it's like us biologists learning about these weird and wonderful organisms that can live in all these extreme environments. Now the astronomers are learning that there are planets that can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So that's our neighborhood. We don't even know what's beyond the neighborhood. We don't even know our own neighborhood as well as we should. Um, believe me, if you had been smart enough to invite me to give this lecture 15 years ago, we would have been done 20 minutes ago. A lot of what I've told you is just, you know, hot off the press the last 10 years, and it's just going to keep getting better and better. I say Ceres wasn't even in here when I started to put this talk together. So what does this all mean? Let's, let's wrap this up with Darwin. Well, Darwin's last paragraph, The Origin of Species, was almost in a way an, an astrobiology, um, an astrobiology summary, I, except in far more beautiful, more poetic language than we write today. So if you could indulge me for a moment and just close your eyes and let me read you those last few sentences because I think they're so beautiful. It is interesting to contemplate an entangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other, and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, 
And that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. You can open your eyes again. To me, that is a magnificently beautiful view of the world. And so I, I feel very bad when someone comes to me who is, um, I, I don't want to use the word deeply religious, because clearly Darwin was a deeply religious man, but that's a totally different thing than being someone who is, is just buying some party line. It's, in, it's very deeply religious in a, in a different sort of way. To say that science takes the beauty and wonder out of the natural world, no, 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 you have it wrong. The natural world has all the beauty and wonder that we need. It is far more amazing and fantastic than anything we could possibly have imagined. But that's where Darwin left it. And so what I submit to you is with astrobiology, how much more amazing would it be if we could say there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into few forms or into one, wherever the conditions are right, not just on planet Earth, but we are in fact part of a huge living universe. And with that, I wish Darwin a happy 205th birthday and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rob John. Uh, we're going to have about we'll have about ten minutes for questions and answers. But uh, I just want to point out something because exoplanets are a field I, I dabble in myself. Um, we have discovered recently from all the new allegedly habitable worlds, because we're not 100 percent, that Earth apparently is marginally habitable because. <laughs> Seriously, they're now calling these other worlds which are more habitable than Earth, super habitable. Which I guess is the exobiology equivalent of supernatural, but I'll leave it at that. So, I think we need to set the second microphone up here, uh, Doug, if you can do that. Get the lights. And if you want to come over here to the uh, side for questions, we have about 10 minutes for that. And no, I mean, it certainly has a lot of radiation, so we do think, it, but it's ionizing radiation that it's providing activated compounds that could get through the ice and help a, a biota that lives there. But in fact, the, the heating comes from this tidal flexing. Just like we get the tides because of our interactions with the moon, and in fact, the Earth deforms just a little bit because of this interaction. That's the same sort of thing there, but in their case, in the case of Europa, Jupiter is so magnificently large, and Europa is about the size of our moon, so the, the flexing is even greater than that. So there's that, and we think there may also be a little radioactive heat coming internally the way there is on the Earth as well. So it's not radiation like the sun's radiation that's heating it up with this tidal flexing for the most part. Does that help? Great. Is there a creationist um, response to what, what you've said here about you know, life outside of Earth? And do you know what that might be? Or have you had a chance to, to talk with creationists about what their ideas are on this? Well, it's usually not a good scene when you, because if you're a biblical literalist, I think there are people who believe that Lucifer was banished elsewhere. And if we find life elsewhere, it's only going to be bad news. <laughs> uh, 
so, um, you know, I, I, cannot, I cannot speak for, for all creationists, um, but uh, that, that's the only relevant comment that I've heard. Um, but, well, I, I should let the rest of the questions go. I know uh, my friend Guy Consomagno, who is the um, curator of meteorites for the Vatican Observatory, is giving a talk at Santa Clara on uh, Tuesday afternoon. And I know he's written about some of these sorts of things. Well, as, uh, as far as that last question, I actually have heard a lot about Christian's response, including on that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard him uh, say, deny that there is any evidence for extrasolar planets, uh, because you can't visually see them. And I've also heard that the reason why the only reason why scientists are, are uh, searching for, extra for life on other planets is because somehow it would uh, help them disprove the Bible. Really? Uh, yeah. Most interesting. Yes. <laughs> well, my question is, uh, how, do, uh, different, how does a different type of star, like a different main sequence star than our own, or something that's off the main sequence, like a, a cooling down dwarf star or a red giant, affect the possibility of uh, life in that system compared to our own? Ah, now that's a very interesting question. We've, we've been focusing on, on sun-like stars, but most stars out there, I think it's about 90%, are um, red dwarfs. And the bad news is that they're smaller, so any planet that would um, be warm enough for liquid water would have to be fairly close in. The good news is not only are there enormous numbers of them out there, basically they live forever. So any red dwarf that has ever been formed is alive today and will be for billions and billions of years, um, a lot longer than the Earth, uh, than our sun will be in the main sequence. So there are people working on that right now, I think my name's even on some of those papers. Um, and I think we've now talked ourselves into the fact that you could conceivably have life around an, uh, on a planet around a red dwarf. Now, our planet, our, our sun will eventually um, turn into a red giant um, and, and then a dwarf. Um, there are planets that are known to go around stellar remnants. So these are second generation stars, like what's going to happen with ours. In fact, the first one was discovered around a neutron star. Um, just over 20 years ago, it was 22 years ago, uh, the meeting in uh, Puerto Rico where they first discovered using the Arecibo telescope a few years ago. And so we know that planets can go around um, stellar remnants. And, and once you're a stellar remnant, you're, you're basically good forever. So that's been sort of my thought is that, you know, we're going to get to a point that we know the sun's getting hotter and hotter. And I don't believe that you know, any one of us is going to willingly turn out the lights, and I have great faith in the technological capabilities of our descendants, so maybe we'll just keep pushing ourselves out and let the sun do its thing, and then when it becomes a stellar remnant, and then it's going to be good for basically 30 billion years or so, we can move back into the neighborhood. There's no reason that any of that couldn't happen. It's, you know, obviously we don't have the technological capability today. But um, there's no reason something like that you couldn't play with it. So yes, there's certainly other so kinds of stars that have planets around them and could potentially be habitable. Um, I think it's fairly well known that water, uh, in particular, uh, has come in the past from um, meteorites and maybe comets uh, passing by, uh, even some organic uh, materials. Uh, and I think I've heard it mentioned that maybe some viruses uh, we find on Earth come that same source. Uh, what do you think about that uh, possibility? Is there any evidence, or is it possible to? What was the last thing you said? The viruses. Viruses. Now, My okay. Company. I was good. I was good up till when you said viruses. I just want to make sure that that's what you said. Um, okay. So we know that comets carry water. As, uh, meteorites carry water. Some people think that as much as maybe 50% or more of our water inventory on the Earth came from comets and meteorites. Um, and organic input. And so that's another reason why we think that, that Venus or um, Mars or whatever should have gotten the same input because we're getting hit by all the same things. And so that's, I don't think in question, the only question is what percent is primordial water and what percent was brought in. But viruses are a totally different situation. Viruses, you know, you could go into these questions if they even alive, but none of them can replicate on their own. They need a host, and they're carefully co-evolved with a host. So I don't see how a virus can come in without a host organism. In fact, some people think that they, they started off as being fairly primitive, 
Um, there are suggestions from this virus that was discovered a few years ago called um, Mimi virus, and then now there's mega virus, these giant viruses that actually do a lot of the genome in there. And to me, that's sort of a smoking gun that this is, these are ones that were in the process of being reduced. So I, I think that that's about as unlikely as I can say without saying the word no. Um, <laughs> the answer to on viruses. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, have they been able to determine if there are any tectonic plates on any of these planets? Or? Um, there's tectonic, there was at least tectonic activity on Venus. Now, you don't have to have tectonic plates to have tectonic activity. Um, Mars, of course, is dry, you know, they're both dried out now, and any tectonic activity would have run down. Um, but I don't know if there is good evidence that there ever was, were plates moving. I, I'm sorry, I'm not enough of a geologist to know, but I haven't heard anyone address that, and I'm sorry. You know, if, if you're one of my students, I say I'll get back to you next Monday. <laughs> if you email me, I'll, I'll see what I can do to find out. Uh, regarding dark matter, uh, our own solar system was full of tiny bits of junk all over the place, not just the asteroid belt, but small stuff. Well, apparently that's been ruled out as a source of dark matter because nobody talks about it, but what's your opinion? Why, why has it been ruled out, and what's your personal opinion on dark matter, dark energy? <laughs> I'm not admitted. <laughs> I'm really not an expert on, on dark matter, and I, I'm also partly laughing because they hit it with Guy. I'm, I'm actually close friends with a lot of the priests in the Vatican Observatory, including one who is um, um, very ill right now and is a little goddess, who is an expert on dark matter, and I, if, if he weren't in the middle of radiation therapy, I wanted him to come with me today, and then he could have answered that for you, and I'm really sorry. I'm, I just don't know enough about it to be able to answer but I hope by saying that, it, you can understand that just because I'm a scientist and, you know, go for Darwin's birthday and so on, doesn't mean that I don't have a lot of friends who are in various religious communities, and you might be surprised with what conclusions they have as well. There's a lot of thought about uh, minimum irreducible complexity mm -hmm. as the uh, pre uh, precluding uh, or prohibiting evolution. Could you comment about that in an intelligible manner where we can hear the arguments for the concept of idea? Right. Um, okay, so this irreducible complexity thing is one of the arguments that the intelligent design people use. And the idea is, for example, how could you possibly get an eye unless all the pieces were there together? Well, of course, the answer is evolution. Um, and just like you don't start with the, highway, the interstate highway system, oh, it started as a baby highway system, you know, with one mile outside of Sacramento. Now, these started as footpaths and pioneer paths, and these were taken over by other things. And the same thing in evolution. The eye starts off with some light-sensitive pigments, and then you start to build the infrastructure around. So yes, at this point, you can't just pull one part apart, but it is pretty easy to explain how you end up with something at this point is a whole bunch of pieces working together. We done? Yeah, we done. Good, take Thank time. Thank you very much. Okay. A couple of things I would like to do. Since we uh, actually are not going to have to kick her around in five minutes, which I'm very happy about. Um, we have drinks, we have cake, we have food, and someone is going to jump up and insist we sing happy birthday, so why don't we just do that now? Who, who's the person that does this every year? Where are they? Okay. Shall we do it? Happy birthday! To you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Charlie. Happy birthday to you. Now let's get some cake. I want to again thank Dr. Rothschild for being here.